More details on the sad mystery of missing flight MH370 here. Quotes, barnacles growing on airplane wreckage washed up on an island off Reunion after the disappearance of Malaysian Airlines flight MH370 have led scientists to promising new models for constructing or rather reconstructing the drift paths of ocean debris and could someday help to solve the great aviation mystery itself, researchers say. Uh, the new temperature and chemistry tools published in the American Geophysical Union Journal are amongst the most precise yet for using shell chemistry, that's the barnacles, to retrace unknown paths of crash debris. This has been the greatest aviation mystery of all time, I would say. How is it in this day and age that a plane can take off? A scheduled plane going on an easy, regular route can just disappear like that. Everybody's had their 10 cents worth. And so far, we haven't found the plane. And somewhere, the bulk of that wreckage is bound to be sitting, unless something else happened, isn't it? Let's talk with Christine Negroni. She's been on this show once before, author of The Crash Detectives, a former air accident investigator and aviation journalist. Christine, sorry for keeping you waiting. Um, the newspapers... Oh, I'm, I'm so glad you did, because I had a chance to hear your last guest, who was <laughs> really phenomenal. He, you know, he's lucky. He had that that six mile, well, I forget the width. That's strip, corridors. And was it uh, 10 it. miles long, was it, and six miles yeah. wide, I think? Yeah, yeah. well, he was kilometers. I think I maybe mm. I mis maybe yeah, sure. I miscalculated, but whatever. He had a space and he found it. And that's like, you know, oh, oh, for the people who would like to say the same thing about Malaysia 370. Sure. Um, I had a thought when I was coming in on my fraught train journey into London tonight. And the thought was this, we can pinpoint a rover, a, a Russian rover that crashed onto the surface of the moon, um, you know, easily. Uh, we've done that this last week. And yet here on this earth, we cannot find an airliner that contained, sadly, I think 239 people. Yeah. After, what is it, eight years now, nine years now? You know, it, it seems to, it beggars belief that that can be the case. Why is this? such a huge conundrum and such a difficult task. Well, see, I have to argue with you, Howard. I, I think the difference between the rover and the moon, and which is there's one and one, and all eyes were on the rover, not to mention all sorts of other scientific acoustic equipment and everything else, and commercial aviation, in which at any point in time, there are tens of thousands of airplanes traveling around the world. And the only ones we really have radar on are those which are transiting land masses. So the others who are out of radar really uh, must rely on satellite technology, which prior to Malaysia 370, uh, many airlines would be opting for financial reasons to have satellite le location every 15 or 30 minutes. In the case of Malaysia, as I recall, it was every 30 minutes. So that's a big difference between, uh, you know, being able to know what one thing, what happens to one thing and being able to keep track of so many. And that I, I don't really think so much of that has changed, except obviously the frequency with which these airliners are. Uh, location is tracked has has increased because of Malaysia 370 and Air France 447 before that. I think there are moves to try and get another expedition to go out to a supposed location site. Uh, I don't know how they're going. Do you think those things help now? Uh, could it be that the wreckage has now dispersed to such an extent after nine years that we're never really going to find anything meaningful? Well, Look, there's a couple of things I'd say about that. One is the wreckage is dispersed. We already know that the, that the plane was coming down at such speed that if, what, if it hadn't already come apart in the air, which it might probably have done, was when it hit impacted the water, it was turned into, you know, tiny chunks. So pretty much like what your previous guest was talking about with his, with his, um, with his space stuff. So I think that's problem number one. Problem number two is it's not... The, the thing they're really trying to find in that airplane are the black boxes. So it's not even finding the wreckage, it's finding a subcomponent of the wreckage, which are two bread box size, and that's being generous, two bread box size boxes on the seafloor. So it really is a very, very, very hard ask to get that information. I'm not, uh, you know, and I've written about this before, Howard, you know my opinion on this. 
I think the concentration on finding the wreckage is misplaced. I think there's a lot of information right here on the Earth, right on terrestrial Earth, that will give us a very good idea of what happened to that airplane. But Malaysia, Australia, whoever, Boeing, whatever, are using not finding those black boxes to basically say, and we're not going to ask any more questions, and we're not even going to surmise. And I think that's a dodge because I think there's plenty of good information on the ground that could tell us what happened to that airplane. What do you think happened? Do you think this was some kind of hijack? No, I think it's ridiculous. There's no evidence to show it was a hijacking. And every time I hear those people, I wanna tear my hair out and I don't have much of it left. The fact is the airplane, that airplane, and I've written about this in the crash detectives, that airplane shows all signs of having had a crew become incapacitated from hypoxia. And there are similar airplane accidents, similar airplanes that have crashed with the same sort of preamble. And what's the preamble? I'll put it very simply pilots who do things that make no sense. And what is the one thing we know about Malaysia 370? It makes no sense. That's a very, very good point. And there was a famous case in Europe, the Helios Airways plane, where the crew yes. suffered hypoxia. Yes. So did all the passengers, and that uh, plane flew into a mountainside. Very Correct. rapidly, just to bring you back to the start of this, we've only really got seconds to do this, but just your very quick ballpark thoughts on this barnacle research. Is it as exciting as the papers were trying to say? I think it's exciting. Again, it may or may not lead to where the airplane is. It's a big ocean and lots of teeny pieces. But I think it's very exciting for two reasons. One, that barnacle uh, stuff was talked about when the plane, when the piece of wreckage was very first brought up from from Madagascar. So it's good to see that someone actually followed that research. And the second reason is this: there's a world full of armchair investigators who have great knowledge on incy vincy little things. And this is one perfect example of that. This idea that only the official investigators have, you know, the, the, the key to the box, you know, it's nonsense. And only through using a world full of, of minds can we get to the cause of this accident? Because obviously the professionals aren't spending that much time on it anymore. Christine Negroni, thank you so much for your time again. Uh, Christine Negroni, author of The Crash Detectives, former air accident investigator, aviation journalist, here on The Unexplained. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? He's mocked your weight, Trump. Yeah, look at him. Fail. <laughs> Not working. Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. Do you believe you can win this war? Are you making me cry again? They're trying to force you out. Yes, I feel betrayed. Keep it award-winning. <laughs>